Go ahead, Clint. Our dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this opportunity this evening, both in person and online, for the opportunity that we could gather together and study from your word. We pray that uh, you'd be with Clay as he brings forth uh, this message from James, which you've inspired. We pray that uh, everything that he studied and, and prepared for this evening, that uh, he has ready recollection of all of the things that he has studied. Father, we pray that you'd be with us th throughout the rest of this week. Please uh, guard, guide, direct, and watch over all of us. Keep us safe. And Father, we, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus, that you sent to this earth. And it's through his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Clint. All right. I'm going to, you guys know online, uh, unmute yourself anytime you want to make a, a comment. Um, and uh, we'll get rolling. I do want to, um, I want to mention um, and just remind us of where we ended last week. And we're going to kind of in tonight about the same place but a lot of these different concepts that we've been looking at in the book of james and particularly last week had to do uh, with money and the handling of that and how to handle um looking to the future and tonight as well as you saw the title uh, the, the corrosive nature of wealth and so um we need to just remind ourselves that with so many things in life, we need to be good stewards. We need to take the blessings that God gives us and, and then use them wisely. And, and not just our money, even though it includes our money, but of course, our time, our other resources, our gifts. Uh, Greg likes to talk about the stewardship of influence. We all have a level of influence and God has given us that as a gift and, and we are to be good stewards even of that influence uh, good stewards of relationships just all the different aspects of life we need to strive to take those gifts and then use them to the best of our ability i also appreciated uh, one of the things greg brought out sunday about the light and that would be one of the gifts we've received is the light and we're not the source of the light uh, we reflect the light and that's being a good steward if we allow that to be reflected in our lives. And so that's what we strive to do. And particularly last week, part of that was uh, the idea of time and, and being a good steward of the fact that we are just a mist. We are just a vapor. We're just here for a, a little bit and then we're gone. Well, that should prompt us to be good stewards of that, to be good stewards of that situation, be good stewards of that short time uh, that we do have. And so I'll, I'll remind us of these things again at the end of today, but last week kind of went through that real quickly um, because of time. We just got really close to the end. So let's sing a couple songs tonight. I All right, well, we have already somehow gotten to May 12th and uh, tonight is the corrosive power of wealth. We're gonna spend the next uh, four weeks, including tonight, on James uh, chapter 5, and so very excited about that. This passage here really fits well with um, last week's lesson about slander and the desire for money. I think we, we see uh, very quickly, even with last week's lesson, that, that money, and particularly, as we're told elsewhere, the love of money uh, can be a real detriment uh, to the Christian life. In fact, the love of money... Um, is the root of all evil. Uh, anytime we put something in God's place, anytime we love something uh, more than him, Jesus said you can't serve God and money, um, mammon, uh, material things. You just, you can't do it. You may try to do it. You may try to live a double life for a while, uh, but it's just impossible to sustain that. And not just sustain it, it's impossible to do it. Uh, we may think we're doing it, but if we're trying to do that, then we are not putting God number one. We are not submitting to him. We are not giving our very lives to him. You noticed in the third verse of the song, um, uh, Hold to God's Unchanging Hand, uh, the third verse talked about um, the, the decay that takes place with material things. The, um, of course, uh, Jesus worded it talking about moths that destroy and, and rust and other forms of decay. We just know that the things of this life 
are not going to last. The things of this life are not things we can take with us. You've all seen the pictures or heard the little quotes about, uh, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul. And it's true. It's just not how things work. We don't take any of this stuff with us. And so we hold to God's unchanging hand. We build up treasures on earth. We build up the things uh, that are going to be eternal, the things that will matter 5, 10, 15,000 years from now. We do not want our spirituality, we don't want our faith to be chipped away at. We don't want it to be corroded. We don't want it to decay. We want to stay strong spiritually. Um, we have been, uh, the staff has been working on a, a report for the elders, kind of looking at where we've been and where we're going to go and some maybe some steps that we can take to, to, um, to do well. And, and part of that is next quarter's Wednesday night class called Onward, uh, re-engaging the church um, uh, with culture, and especially after COVID, after the pandemic. And one thing that keeps coming out is how really amazing all of you have been. And that I, I've, I've been reading a couple books and well, we were actually prepping for it for last quarter and then we opened up Sunday night. So we didn't have the Sunday night class. But um, so these books talk about things you can do uh, to help come out of the pandemic or things you can do during the pandemic to, uh, to help. And we've been able to do a lot of them. And, and a lot of the, the, the encouragement for me is how strong all of you have been, how strong the congregation has been through this. And, and it may kind of not seem like that. It may, you know, at, at first glance, it might seem like, well, you know, it's been a tough year and it has. And, you know, and, and it's been a little hard on all of us and it has. But look at how we've been able to display our faith in God by submitting to the elders, by submitting even to our governing authorities, which we're told to do in scripture. I mean, we've, we've been able to put into practice some things that, that we maybe never thought we'd even have to really think about or put into practice. And we've been able to do that. And we've been able to come out pretty strong. And as things have changed, you know, the, the adaptation ability of, of all of you has just been, I just, the more we kind of analyze it and the more we look at it, the more amazing it becomes. And so thank you for encouraging me and, and thank you for just sticking with things. Again, this has been a weird and, and hard year and, and we've been able to do it. And I think that shows that our focus has been on God and not on material things. If there's one lesson that the last year has taught us, it's, hey, you can't count on physical stuff. You can't count on a country or a state or a city. Um, our citizenship's in heaven. You can't count on the world. It is ruled by the prince of the power of the air. And so all these things we've been able to kind of put into practice, again, in a way that we never would have imagined possibly. And so I think that's really cool. And I think that's been a, a really neat thing, especially now looking back and kind of analyzing things and looking at these different things that have been written and the way people are evaluating things. You know, we've been, you know, we've been strong, I think. And uh, we still need to reach out to those that we haven't, you know, seen, but people are doing that. I mean, I think in every way, uh, I think we're going to come out stronger than we were in 2019. I think as things come back, we're going to be, we're going to, each individual's faith will be a little stronger and, and of course, not across the board, there'll be exceptions, but you know what I mean, on average, I think we're gonna come out strong. And as a congregation, I think not having the fellowship opportunities, not having the, the outward unity that we're used to, I think we're gonna come back and just be, as we already have, uh, like with the barbecue and other things that we've done, even on some small scale, I think we're just gonna come out and, and we're gonna be amazed at how much we love each other how much we care about each other, how much we want to be together. And I think, again, we're already seeing it, and I think we're going to see it more. So, so maybe we don't even need this lesson tonight. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but anyway, um, but we need to remember, and that's what James is telling his readers, uh, the people listening uh, to this letter being read in their congregations back in the first century, people need to be reminded that 
you know what? It's not about the money. It's not about what you have. It's about eternity. And the people who take advantage of other people, the people who are focused on money, I mean, our first verse here for tonight, it's a pretty strong condemnation. A lot of people, when they write about James chapter 5, verse 1, they compare it to Jeremiah, compare it to Isaiah, compare it to a lot of the Old Testament prophets who give warnings. And it's, it's pretty intense. And we're, gonna, we're about to, we'll see that in just a moment. I do want to note that it's not just Jesus and James who kind of come down hard on wealth and come down hard on the wealthy. It's not just them, but Paul as well, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 9 and 10. But those who desire to be rich, and notice the desire. Notice it, it, it all stems from the heart, just as the things we've looked at throughout this letter. But those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmless desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. I mean, this is, you know, we, we quote often the, the love of money is the root of all evil, or in the way the ESV translates it, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evils. Um, but notice the strength of the language in these two verses. There's the, the, the word desire, obviously a yearning, a desire, snare, senseless, harmful, plunge, ruin, destruction, and then craving. And then, and I hadn't, I mean, I've read it a thousand times probably, but they pierce themselves with many pangs. Um, you know, when we think of someone being pierced in the New Testament, we think of Christ, pierced for our transgressions. But here, people who crave this, they pierce themselves. And so again, it's, again, it's not just James and Jesus, but Paul here giving that same message that if that's our drive, if that's what we want, and it kind of takes me back to Matthew chapter 6, if what someone wants is to be seen when they fast, pray, or give, then they've got their reward. If someone has a craving for this earthly stuff, whether it's notoriety, uh, money, whatever it might happen to be, if that's their craving, if that's their desire, they're heading for destruction. They are actually piercing themselves. Extremely interesting to me and obviously uh, very strong. Um, I'm not going to read the whole quote I was going to read, um, but uh, Motyer, and I've, I've used him uh, throughout this, and, and um, uh, Nystrom, I'm, I'm going to be quoting him at the end, um, another commentary I've been using a lot. But he breaks this down, verses 2 through 6, to talk about hoarding, fraudulence, indulgence, and betrayal. And this is where the people in this paragraph that James is talking about, this is what they do. Some of them just want to accumulate wealth. Some are frauds as they do it. Some are, they, they take that wealth and they kind of forget about God, forget about other people, and they just indulge themselves in the things that they have accumulated. And then, of course, the, the last verse, or maybe it's five, but five or six, talks about actually murdering their servants. I mean, actually killing people uh, because of their greed, because of this love of wealth and money. So, um, so anyway, just extremely um, strong language as James goes uh, through this. I've got uh, quite a quote. Let me just read the first. I might read the whole thing. I'll just do it really quickly. Um, Finally, we must have it constantly before our minds that it was the love of money that betrayed the Lord Jesus. In Matthew's gospel, the word then occurs again and again. It's kind of like in the Hebrew narratives, the word and or now or but begins almost every single sentence in some narrative places. Well, in this, in this narrative in Matthew, it's then, and then this, then this, then this. Um, and especially, Motyer points out in 2614, um, in a most beautiful and moving gesture, a woman who Matthew leaves unnamed, but look in John 12, uh, pours a precious anointing oil on Jesus' head. To her, it was an act of loving devotion, 
To Jesus, it was a delight, something worthy to accompany the preaching of the gospel all around the world. To the disciples, it was waste compared with what might be done to relieve world poverty. And to Judas Iscariot, it was the last straw. Then he left to barter away his Lord for 30 pieces of silver. We're not told why the incident acted like a trigger in this way for Judas. There was just something about a devotion which put Jesus so incomparably above the world's goods, which he could not accommodate, um, but must rather contradict. Would we be surprised if only we could remember how often the Lord Jesus Christ has taken second place in our lives uh, to possessions and has been much less than, than the Lord of our, less than Lord of our financial um, arrangements, I should say than. Um, Jesus should be the umbrella by which we do everything in life. Uh, every relationship, every financial transaction, every piece of material things that we, everything should be under the Lordship of Christ. Everything should be Jesus gives an amen or a thumbs up to this purchase, to this relationship, to this way I'm spending my time. He's Lord. He's Lord of all. And if we put anything above him, that's idolatry. And, you know, we don't have little golden figures or little things that we've cut out of wood and burn some and worship some. And, you know, we don't do it that way anymore. But we can be just as guilty of idolatry. Worldly wealth is an area of high risk in the battle to walk humbly with God. It's hard to be rich and lowly at the same time. The use of money and the life of self-pleasing are never far apart. And, of course, Jesus over and over and over again, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's impossible <laughs> uh, you know, for a rich man uh, to enter the kingdom. So, you know, Jesus, James, Paul, across the board, we need to realize the risk of wealth. We need to realize the risk of having goods. We need to realize the risk of having possessions. And I think good stewardship, you know, that there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to be aware and we need to be on top of it. And we need to be very, very, very uh, prayerful. So, um, uh, go ahead, Susan. Hold yeah, just uh, I had a question. Hold on, um, just a second. Let me unmute this thing okay. so people can hear you. Okay, go ahead. I had a question because it's. I think you're saying like it's be very cautious if you do have things that would fall maybe in the um, affluent category, right? Of of monetary, um, because I think about like Solomon and David, and I was just wondering. You know, they're both kings had a lot. Do you think that they fell, I don't want to say fallen away and mix that up, but do you think they went a little bit away from God when they got their wealth? Or do you think, because you have the whole, David was a man after God's own heart, that he kept it in check to some extent. But he's obviously really wealthy, right? I, I think David did better than Solomon. Um, Solomon seems to have had a real low point near the end of his life, it seems like he bounced back. Um, David, of course, it was more his, um, you know, temptations. And, but he wouldn't have had that opportunity if he wasn't kind of living luxury. You know, I mean, then, then that's part of it too. Um, the, um, you know, our society is, is affluent enough that people have, uh, you know, free time. You know, people, you know, people would farm the land even 100 years ago, 150 for sure, we were way more rural than we are now. And, you know, people, they could contemplate the scriptures. They could pray to God as they plowed the field, as they milked their cows, you know. And, and we can still do that today to some extent. If we, if we have a, a job where it's kind of uh, repetitious. When I worked at Honda um, uh, for six months, you know, it was, it was uh, two hours on this job, two hours on this job, two hours on this job, two hours on this job. Um, with with little breaks, and I could pray during that time, um, and and so you know I think, but but there were more people in those situations where they could be contemplative, um, and affluence, you know, and uh, you know, all of us compared to first century Christians are affluent. Anyone listening to this class tonight, anyone in this room, I mean, we you know we have possessions, we have a place to lay our head. You know, Jesus said the Son of Man has no place to lay his head, no place to say, stay and sleep. Um, you know, we are, you know, we fall into this. We, you know, there's not one of us who doesn't need to be aware and, you know, and, and thinking about 
you know, how we're going to handle our possessions. Um, so, um, but yeah, David and Solomon, that's tough. And it's Abraham. I mean, he was a sheik. I mean, there's no other way to describe Abraham. He was a traveling, I mean, he, he had an army. He went off and defeated five kings by himself with his men. I mean, you know, he, you know, the, you know, he was, and he was, you know, the father of all the faithful, you know, and he might've been the most wealthy person we've ever read about in scripture. So it, it, so you can be faithful and have money and have possessions. Um, but, but you just have to be aware, you know, you got to be on top of it. Uh, the David and Solomon, that's an interesting thing to contemplate, but I don't know which one. I think they both struggled a little. Now, Solomon, of course, um, you know, uh, I believe he's the writer of Ecclesiastes. And, um, you know, he, he talked about the vanity of it all. He finally did realize, you know, okay, you know what, these possessions, uh, women, all the different things he contemplates in Ecclesiastes, you know, hey, this is, this is all vain. There's, there has to be something better than this. And of course, his end, his end conclusion is uh, fear the Lord, you know, so uh, good end conclusion for that book. <laughs> but uh, anyway, thanks for that. Did that, I mean, I don't know if that really answered your question, but anyway. It was, it was good um, thinking out loud. So okay. yeah. it, it, it discussed it and reasoned through some perspective of it. So okay. I'll give you a yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, whoever's tallying the people in agreement with me and the people not in agreement, give me one for Susan. <laughs> okay. No. Um, so, um, so as we start this text, let me mute this. Um, so come now, this is that same little phrase we talked about last week that shows James to be uh, pretty highly educated. This was, these are the only two places in the whole New Testament where this, I mean, it doesn't sound that intelligent to us, come now. But the, the Greek he uses is Hellenistic Greek. It's, it's an old form that shows that he might have been reading, you know, Plato or whoever else. So he, um, he, he uses a rich, educated Greek throughout his letter, uh, but particularly here, this is one of those signs of it. So come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. And this is, this is where we, you know, have our similarities with the prophets, because this is how the prophets would talk to uh, those who were, you know, secular or those who were, uh, in God's face, it would be, you know, miseries are coming. This is what's going to happen to you. And this is even spoken in kind of that way. Uh, it's not, it's, it's not a command to turn around. It's, it's not a maybe. This is, this is the way it is. You rich, the miseries are coming. And it's, it's, it's current. They're coming upon you. And then we get into what they're doing. The, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten, your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. And of course, what he means is you've laid up treasures for yourself. You've laid up uh, treasure in a worldly sense. You have accumulated, you've hoarded, as, as Motyer put it, uh, you've laid up treasure in the last days. Uh, Jesus says, you know, you don't want to compile, you don't want to build up things in this life where rust and moth will destroy. You want to lay up your treasures in heaven. You want to lay up for yourself spiritual things, spiritual uh, blessings. All right. And so this is how Jesus put it. Uh, again, from the Sermon on the Mount, which James just doesn't parallel, of course, but so many references. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there, were, there your heart will be also. I did find a picture. I was looking for... Um, and I just went with the uh, corrosive symbol uh, that you'd see on a truck. But um, there was a picture where there was a moth on a rusty, um, oh, what was it? 
there, a moth on rust. I mean, basically someone had actually, and it was a live shot. Like it wasn't a cartoon or anything. Someone, a moth had landed. I don't know how they got the moth to land there. If they did it on purpose, they could have put some sugar or something. But um, anyway, uh, there was actually a picture of a moth on a rusted, rusted wheel or something, which was kind of cool. But um, just to, you know, illustrate this and, and how the things of this life are temporary. 21's the key. Well, the, the whole thing is great, obviously, but 21's our key here. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. So if your treasure is other people's faith, if, you're, if your treasure is the Lord Jesus Christ, ultimately, if your treasure is spiritual things, then, then you're going to be all right. Uh, you're going you're gonna, to, you, we'll make mistakes still, but but you'll pretty much get your life in the order that it needs to be. Um, if, you, if you lose something, if you lose a worldly possession, you will not, um, you know, it won't upset you like it might upset uh, someone who's not in Christ. Um, it's kind of like, you know, it's kind of like with death. You know, we don't grieve like non-Christians. We just don't grieve the way a non-Christian grieves because we know what really matters. We know there's a next life. We know that things are okay. And the world just doesn't know that. And the same is true with material things. The same is true with money. Um, a a non-Christian will get in way more distress. I, I sometimes watch a show called um, FBI. And, and last night, um, the, the whole episode was about greed, uh, basically. Uh, everyone's motivation, the criminal's motivation, uh, all their motivations were... Uh, for money, to make a buck. Uh, people had short, um, they did a, a short sale on some stock. And so the, the person who did the short sale uh, was wanting the company to go down the tubes, of course. And, and the, 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 the other investors wanted the company to go up. And the, the whole thing, I mean, people got killed over this. People, and, and hundreds of millions of dollars uh, were involved, uh, not just something that we might be involved in. Um, but a Christian wouldn't have been quite so motivated, right? Um, and, and that's where we need to be. We need to realize that, that our treasure needs to be eternal. Yeah, Ben. Yeah, we, we, would, we would strive to make sure the teens at uh, Hendersonville understood whatever that much is that you were talking about. Because if... If, if you're young, there's, there's a temptation to say, and not just young, if you're, if, if you're not making as much money as you want to be making, <laughs> there's a temptation to say, well, I'll put money in the plate when I have this much, or I'll put money in the plate when I have this much. But the biblical concept is, if you're faithful with little, then you'll be blessed. You know, you'll receive more. And if you're faithful with that, then you'll receive more. If you're not faithful with the 10 bucks, then you may not be blessed with 100 bucks. You know, whatever the much is, we need to be faithful with it. And we can't wait to be good stewards when there's some large amount that has been amassed. It needs to be, I'm going to be a good steward with whatever amount it is. Uh, ben also mentioned um, the idea of the wealth and other things causing blinders to be on people. And, and that'll be actually part of our text here in James, uh, verses four through six. And we'll, and I've already said it once, uh, you know, the, the wealthy end up ignoring God. And I don't mean the wealthy in a general sense, the wealthy that James is talking about, the ones who are focused on it, the ones where this is their treasure. Um, they, they tend to ignore God and they tend to ignore others. Getting back to what Ben said about the whole purpose of wealth is to serve other people. Uh, ultimately, the whole purpose of it is to serve God. And Jesus said, you know what? If you give someone food or drink or visit them or give them clothes, you did it for me. You know, the, this, this concept of serving and giving, and again, being a good steward of all these blessings, that's, that's key uh, in Scripture. So uh, go ahead, Susan. Yes, a couple, couple things I was thinking there. One is like just about the giving, and I know Old, um, Old Testament talks about a tenth, right, and 
I think as people get into that, I know f for like us not growing up in the church, learning more and more about it and thinking about the tenth is the minimum. Um, even though there's nothing, I think, in New Testament, it just says, I think, a, a cheerful giver, right? Um, but I know things we've heard on the way is like the tenth would really be a minimum. And then the um, the challenge in even doing that, because, you know, do you do tenth off the gross or do you ten out, tenth off the net? <laughs> and it's like, well, if you're really going all in, it's probably off of gross, right? Not your net. And and then um, thinking about the other thing too is Dave Ramsey. Somebody, a couple people have have followed Dave. I forget what the name of the book it is, but basically, I think when you're all said and done, you're out of debt, and with the rest of the money, you just plan to give it away. You look for ways to give it away. So I didn't know if you had any thoughts around that. Um, if you know anything about Dame Ramsey or or that type of direction. I love Dave Ramsey. So, yes. Um, he And and really, the, the only other thing besides being joyful in your giving in the New Testament is that the giving should be sacrificial. I mean, that's that's the deal. Um, and that's, that's tough. That's tough for us because am I giving enough where it changes what I eat? Am I giving enough where it changes where I live? Am I giving enough that it changes what I drive, what I wear, what I, and, you know, for those of us, really, I mean, a lot of us in this world today, a lot of us on this, in this Zoom call and in this room, um, you know, that's, that's tough. And so, you know, to, to evaluate that, to figure that out, um, and, but sacrificial is the key. So is this giving a sacrifice or is it not? Now, it's interesting, um, almost at any congregation, you're going to have some people who are extremely wealthy. And uh, Greg talked about some people um, in Nashville when he was growing up at the West End Church, where they, they had to be careful to not run the church. You know, they had to be careful where they did not want to give so much that when they died, the church would fall apart. I mean, so, so some people that have so much need to watch on the other end to make sure that that the body is able to do the work together and where there aren't just two or three people, um, you know, providing 90% of, of the funds. And uh, so that's, that's an interesting concept too. And those people have to do kind of like what you were saying that Dave Ramsey said, they have to find other ways to, to get rid of the money, you know, if they want to get rid of it or set up trusts or do whatever they need to do. But, um, uh, Oh, to have that problem? No, I'm just kidding. I don't. I don't want that problem. So anyway, that that might be a little too far. But uh, I, who knows? Some of us, you know, we don't know how we would handle that. Uh, we'd like to think that we'd do a great job. The way the Bible tells us we can know is: Do you do a great job with the twenty dollar bill? Do you do a great job with the fifty? Do you do a great job with a thousand dollars? Are you a great steward of the thousand? If you're a great steward of the ten, a hundred, or a thousand then probably you would be a great steward of $100,000 or whatever the case might be. But that's the key. We want to be good stewards of what we got. Um, uh, Susan, to, to continue with what you were saying, the, the, the key is sacrificial. The key is that you give everything. I mean, we give 100% belongs to the Lord. That doesn't mean we put 100% in the plate, but 100% belongs to the Lord, and it should all glorify Him. You know, so that's that's really the key. So... If they know it's worth it. I mean, they they analyze all that. I can't believe it's worth it, but they know it is. So I, anyway, it, it is hard to believe. But uh, anyway, we better we better keep on moving. Um, several other passages here that relate to this laying up, and, and I'm I'm just going to share a few with you. They're very quick. Uh, Job thirteen twenty eight. Man wastes away like a rotten thing, <laughs> like a garment that is moth eaten. So this isn't just a New Testament uh, concept. And then, and then back to our, our passage here. So, okay, let's look at verses um, uh, four through six. So again, we just need to, and it, it's a life process to some extent, but what really matters to us? What really matters to you? Um, that's what matters. Do, do godly things, Christ ultimately, is that what matters? Or is it, you know, I want to look good here. I want to accomplish this here. I want to have this much in my bank account. Um, and again, nothing wrong with having goals. You know, I don't want to, it's, it's where the emphasis is. It's where the heart is um, that, that matters. So then four through six, 
Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields. Oh, I, I, I wanted to say real quick, even before four through six, back in this culture, um, you know, it was, you know, sometimes people complain uh, that here in America or in our world today, there's, there's disparity, but nothing like in Bible times. I mean, in Bible times, it was just a very few people who, um, who were merchants and the landowners were the big cheeses, <laughs> so to speak. And that's who James was talking about the merchants in chapter four. Now he has shifted to even more elite. He's shifted to these landowners. So behold the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. And, and maybe that would be better translated. He is not able to resist you. He is not uh, fighting back or can't fight back. Um, the, and Daniel, if you have insight on that, I'll take it. <laughs> on that little, he does not resist you. Um, Daniel has taught James in the past, so he's, he's been very helpful this quarter. Um, but, um, the, but notice a few things before we look at the actual, uh, uh, more of the text here. Notice it's the Lord of hosts. And I just think that's cool. I think that's one of the, the most amazing names for the Lord that we have in the Old and New Testaments. I should have looked up to see how often that's in the New Testament. I don't think a whole lot. It's, a, it's abundant in the Old Testament. And what it really means, the literal meaning is um, the Lord of armies. It's, it means armies, the host. And, of course, angelic armies, sometimes it's specified, but but the, it's, it's similar to the phrase Lord of Lords. It's just showing that he is the Lord of, of all, that he takes, you know, the supreme spot. And um, so Lord of hosts. And I just, I think that's neat. And, and I've, I've given, I've, I've got some slides in here concerning the crying out. And I'm, I'm not going to read them all just because of time. But let's um, look at a few of these uh, concerning uh, Cain killing his brother. What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. I just, I think these passages that talk about this, this uh, personification of the blood, the personification of, of other living things, kind of this figurative way of looking at the crying out, I think it's really neat. And what it's getting at is God has been taken to a point. God is patient. God is forgiving god is gracious but there comes a point and there came a point even with christ god in the flesh where okay enough is enough and that happened when jesus gave his woes to the pharisees it happened when uh his father's temple uh was being uh, misused you know there were times where it was just enough is enough and these times where the bible describes this crying out and the lord hearing it means he's now engaged in this or, or got to the point where uh, the patience, the grace, it, you know, as not, I don't want to say run out, but you know what I mean. And it's, it's all to help us understand and get a feel uh, for what's uh, happening. Um, and then here's one of the woe passages. Um, the, um, this talking about the shedding of the blood. Um, and uh, let me move to the next. Um, the righteous blood shed on earth there in verse uh, 35. Um, Genesis 18, uh, the crying out uh, of Sodom and Gomorrah, or the, uh, the, the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then the men set out from there and they looked down towards Sodom. Abraham went with them to set them on their way. And then drop down to verse uh, 19. You know, shouldn't we tell Abraham about this? He's going to be the father of all nations. He's going to be uh, the one where Christ comes. Shouldn't we tell him what we're about to do? And then 20 and 21, then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. I, I love that last little phrase here in, in Genesis 18, 21. Of, of course God's going to know, and of course he does know, but 
this, this language for Abraham, you know, hey, if, you know, if it turns out that this cry is, is false, if it turns out that they're not really sinning this bad, you know, I'll know. But obviously he knew. Yeah, Bill, go ahead. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, all right. And then I think, um, yes. And then just more about uh, Sodom and Gomorrah and Lot. Just, you know, all these encouraging things. <laughs> Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot, they were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But on the day when Lot went out of Sodom, fire and sulfur rained from heaven and destroyed them all. So, will it, so it will be on the day when the Son of Man is revealed. On that day, let the one who's on the housetop with his goods in the house not come down from them to take them away, not come down to take them away. And likewise, let the one who is in the field not turn back. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever seeks to preserve his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will keep it. So another parallel with what James is talking about. If you're caring about this life, if that's your focus, if your focus is, well, I better take care of myself in this life. I better accumulate goods. I better have money. If, if that's the focus, if your focus is to preserve your physical life, then you'll lose it. But whoever's willing to submit and give in to that and take up his cross daily and die to self, that person will save their life. Um, and then another one more crying out, Romans 8, uh, two verses here. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So here we have the whole creation crying out and groaning. And it's interesting here, we should join in that. We should join in that groaning. We should join in that lament, the crying out concerning evil and the fall and decay and death and all the things that come along with the fall. And I think we should cry out and lament against the love of money. Uh, we should cry out, we should be against uh, the whole idea of elevating money above God. And that's what it really gets to. And so, um, again, I, we, we just need to be watchful of ourselves uh, in, these, in this uh, particular area. Uh, and that's what James is writing this for. It's a warning uh, to these people. Um, and so, um, any other, well, we don't even have time, so sorry I even started to say that. Yeah, that's great. Another place of crying out are the martyrs in Revelation. And they cry out, and Daniel mentioned that there's even a question there. When will this be made right? When will there be the judgment? And, and God's the one. He's the one who, can, who will and has the right uh, to bring the judgment. We talked about that last week. Um, and we've, that's come up in the first and second Thessalonians class too. The fact that if we judge, if, if we're the ones putting ourselves in the place of God, uh, we, we need to, you know, obviously stop doing that. We need to let that be God's uh, job and his place. Um, and then one final quote from the other uh, commentary that I've been using a lot, um, uh, Nystrom. The message of James does not sound sweet to our ears because our society encourages the upward direction. But James is not interested in molding the gospel into a shape demanded by society. Instead, he calls us to a sober and steady gaze at our lives as individuals and collectively as the church, urging a sudden opening of the eyes concerning wealth. Money has made us blind. And so we do need to just, we just need to watch. We need to be careful, just like we do with all the other areas of Christian living, uh, concerning morality, concerning ethics, concerning worship, concerning fellowship, just everything. We need to make sure we keep our eyes open. We take a look in the mirror, evaluate, and, and make sure we're on the right uh, path. Um, and here's where Nystrom uh, mentions the power and peril of wealth can cause someone to ignore God, ignore brothers and sisters. And of course, um, there'll be judgment in the end uh, concerning this. So I really appreciate all your comments. Um, one little passage left. Behold, this was the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had pride, excess of food and prosperous ease, but did not aid the poor and needy. The people, sometimes, sometimes the wealthy, become blinded to all the needs around them. 
and that's and I, I, I think we do a great job of supporting those who are in need. Um, but keep watching. We need to keep making sure that not only collectively as a church, but individually, we're willing to help people out. They were haughty and did an abomination before me, so I removed them when I saw it. So there will be judgment in the end for those who are selfish. Again, we remind ourselves to be good stewards, and the time is short, and we need to take care of our money as well. All right, so patience in the face of suffering. A little more these past two weeks, a little more on the negative side. Hopefully I've um, not made it too awful for you. Uh, but 7 through 11, the idea of patience, um, enduring really, persevering through rough times. So let's, let's pray together. Uh, God, we're so thankful for all your blessings. We thank you for these opportunities to look at your word. Father, you're just a great God. You're awesome. You have poured out your blessings into our lives. We are so thankful. And God, we know that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness. God, you've, we're, we're set spiritually. We're set in our faith. And so help us to realize that that's what's really important. But God, help us to be good stewards. Help us to take uh, the things we have and use them wisely. Uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.